we're going to do tomorrow is start looking how to construct graphs. I'm going to actually have you do a little graphing by hand. <laughs> it's like, why are we graphing by hand? You guys think about why I would have you graph by hand. I mean, this is 2012. We have computers. Why would I ask you to graph by hand? A couple reasons. Number one, you have a much better understanding of what the computer is doing when you can graph by hand. Number two, any of the AP science tests, they ask you to graph, and it is by hand. They have the axes already laid out for you, the grid work on the test. You have to graph on it. Right? Number three, college professors, many of them expect you to be able to graph by hand. Now, having said that, we're only going to do hand, hand graphing for the very first lab. Very first lab, I'm going to have you do it both ways. And assuming it looks like you know what you're doing after that lab, then all the subsequent labs for the rest of the year, I'll have you graph exclusively on the computer. All right? So make sure you, you get this the first time around, and we'll be good for the rest of the year. All right, well, I'll start looking at how to go about constructing a graph. So my goal today is to, to have you go through making a sample graph that you can keep in your notes and refer back to anytime you're making another graph. This is an example of what a good graph looks like. Uh, first thing, when you're making a graph, make sure you're using the entire sheet of paper. Do not try to cram a graph into one small corner of the page. And again, let's talk about why. Why would you not want to have your graph occupying just a small part of the page. Less accurate, you're not going to have as accurate of a plot because each block in that graph paper might represent 50 units instead of one. So you're going to have a harder time plotting it. Uh, what about from the standpoint of somebody looking at the graph? Not only is it going to be less accurate when you're plotting it, but it's going to be harder to read. It's going to be harder to recognize the trend, what's happening to the data. So you want to take up all the paper. All right? don't, be, uh, don't skimp on the paper. We like to support the lumber industry. All right? The other thing is graphs always need a title. And the format for the title of your graph, and the title should go at the top of the page, is always whatever your dependent variable is, then the word versus, and then whatever your independent variable is. Now, a graph without a title, you'll lose some points. A graph with an incorrectly formatted title, you'll lose some points. This is the, uh, the scientific convention for, for how it's done. So as an example of that, if you remember that Example we talked about yesterday where we looked at your grades and how they related to the amount of time you spend studying. Here's a, a sample title for that graph. The grades of Physics 1 students, that was our dependent variable. And then versus the time spent studying, which was our independent variable. So at a bare minimum, that's what you would need. You could certainly make your title much more descriptive than that. And you could say grades of Honors Physics 1 students in the period 6 class at Dallastown Area High School during the 2012. Yeah, you get the idea. But at a bare minimum, that's what you need. Here's a uh, data set that we're going, going to actually plot on your graph paper. So take a minute, maybe on a piece of notebook paper in your notes or somewhere, and jot down the data. So you have it. The idea is somebody's going back into the lab and measured out six different volumes of some liquid. 10, 20, 40, 50, 80, and 100 milliliters. And then taken that liquid over to the balance and gotten the mass. And this is the mass of just the liquid itself. We've already subtracted out the mass of the beaker. And like I said, I made this data up. I did not actually record this. And you can tell that because if you look at these masses, they're all 0 0.0. What are the odds of that? <laughs> that every single one would be something 0 0.0 grams? Not going to happen. That's but, you know, it made up a case, it, it certainly can. All right, so the first thing we want to do is title our, our graph. And so that we're all doing this consistently, let's uh, hold our graph paper a right, portrait as opposed to landscape. Hold it that way and put an appropriate title at the top of your graph based upon our two variables and, and the rule for, for making titles. So our, our variables were volume and mass. You have to figure out which is the independent, which is the dependent and title it appropriately. So go ahead and do that. It should be mass versus volume. The dependent variable is the mass. That always comes first. Right? Mass versus volume. Volume is independent. Volume is the thing that we manipulate. We go into the lab, we control the volume. The mass depends on it. All right? So you should all have something that looks like this. Mass versus volume. Or we could say mass of liquid versus volume if you wanted to be more descriptive. 
the other thing you can go ahead and do now is to actually draw in the axes, and that's why I gave you the, the straight edge for that. Give yourself no more than an inch margin at both the left and bottom of the page. All right, we don't need a lot of space for labeling. No more than an inch. All right, so this is your paper. This is what it should look like at, at this time. All right, two axes, both no more than about an inch away from the edge of the page. Because remember, we want to use most of that page for the actual plot. We want the data to be spread out so we have a more accurate plot and it's easier to recognize the trend. All right, next thing we need to do is label those axes. So go ahead and label the y-axis with whatever variable that should be labeled with and the correct units. And label your x-axis for whatever variable should go there along with the correct units. For that, you should have mass on the vertical axis because that's the dependent variable along with the units for mass, which are grams. And volume should go on the horizontal or x-axis with units of milliliters. That's the independent. What do we have to do before we plot points? Yeah, we need to figure out what scale we're going to use, right? And that, that takes some time to set up that scale. We have to figure out a scale for both the horizontal and vertical axes, and we have to number it off. Now, before you do that, let's talk about a couple things. Right? We already mentioned this. We want that data to be spread over as much of the paper as we possibly can. So given that, do we have to use the same scale on the x-axis that we use in the y-axis? Now, if we let five blocks be 10 milliliters on the x-axis, does five blocks have to be equal to 10 grams on the y-axis? Or if we, can we use a different scale? No. You don't have to use the same scale for each axis. In fact, it can be very unusual that you did have the scale, same scale for each axis. Right, each axis you take independently based upon the numbers that you're given. Now, you might have very, very small numbers in the x-axis, very, very large numbers in the y-axis. You're going to have to use different scales. Next question, do you have to begin at the origin? Do we have to start with zero grams and zero milliliters in the graph, or can we start with something like 10 or 50 or 100? Uh, the answer is false. You don't have to start at the origin. In fact, most times you won't start at the origin. Let me give an example of why. Let's say, there's my graph, and let's say that all of my data for the y-axis, maybe these are masses, just like in your little example here. Let's say all of my masses range from 100 grams to 200 grams. Every last data point is somewhere in that range of 100 to 200. If you started at the origin, right, and you labeled it like this, zero, here's 100, here's 200, where would all your data be? Would you have anything at all plotted in the halfway point of the graph or below? Now, every last data point would be up here. In other words, you'd be completely wasting all that space. Right? The goal here is to get an accurate plot. To get an accurate plot, we want to use as much of the page as we can. So if all the data ranges from 100 to 200, start with 100 and go to 200. Right? That'll take the data and spread it out over the paper. Uh, same thing in the x-axis. Maybe the x-axis volumes, maybe they're volumes that range from uh, oh, maybe 500 to 700 milliliters, let's say. Right? If that's the case, you'd start this at 500 and you'd end it at 700. All right. All right, another question. Do you have to number each and every grid line on the graph paper? Good. I mean, that'd be really confusing if you did, right? Now, typically, you label like maybe every 10 or every 100, depending on, on what your data spread is. This is what Logger Pro did for this set of data. If you take the data table that I gave you guys, you put it in the Logger Pro, this is how it scaled the axes. And, and notice on the volume axis down here in the horizontal, it did start at zero and it went to 100. But on the mass axis, it didn't start at zero. It started at 10. And that's because what was your, what was your smallest mass value? Your table is 12 grams, right? All right, so there's no point in starting at zero. Uh, we can start at 10 because 12 is already bigger than that. And that allows the data to be spread over more of the page. All right, so here's what we've got to do. Oh, and, and the other thing, notice that you place a little mark next to each of the numbers. Every time you write down a number on that graph paper, you put a little either vertical line or horizontal line next to it. So the person looking at your graph knows which grid line goes along with that number. All right, we need to come up with a scale. And let's start with 
the horizontal axis. We want to start with zero. This is volume in milliliters. And we want to end up with 100, because that's our biggest volume. And now we need to figure out how to divide up those blocks in between. So the trick is just to start going across there. Maybe you try every four blocks for every 10 milliliters. Maybe you try five, maybe you try six. But you want to you come up with something that's going to put 100 right over on the, on the very right side of the page. You don't want to go off the page, but you don't want to end with 100 being way before you get to the end of it, because we want to use most of the paper. So play around with that a little bit. What I'd like to know is how many blocks on the graph paper should we let equal to every 10 milliliters? How many blocks for every 10 milliliters? You found something that worked there, right? OK, just looking at uh, Kara's graph, she found something that worked nicely because her 100 line is almost to the very right-hand side of the page. And how many blocks did you have for every 10? OK, she said five blocks equal to 10 milliliters. All right, that I think will work. Anybody try six? I'm guessing six might take you too far and, and put you off the paper. Four probably isn't enough. If you go every four, you're going to end at 100 long before you get to the end of the paper. So if you go every five, you want a number maybe every 10 milliliters or every 20, something like that. And don't forget, each time you write a number, put a little pencil line on the grid line next to that number. So somebody looking at your graph knows which line that number corresponds to. I didn't mention it, but probably you understand this. <laughs> Pencil is probably a good idea for doing a graph, just because you, you wind up having to make adjustments as you go. Now, will we want to use the same kind of scale for the y-axis? Would, would five blocks being every 10 grams also be a good idea for the y-axis? y-axis mass in grams. Remember, we said we're going to start that at 10 instead of 0. We said that's what the computer did. We'll do the same thing. And we want it to end at 100. Why would I not use the same scale on the y-axis as I did the x? It's longer. So we're going to go more than five blocks. The other thing is, if we start at 10, we only have 90 grams to go where we had 100 milliliters to go the other direction. So go ahead and see if you can see something would work out nicely for the y-axis. How many blocks should we let equal to every 10 grams on the y-axis? And we want it to be more than five, maybe six, seven, eight, something like that. Yeah, so seven or eight I think will work. Either one's fine, doesn't matter what you do. I'll write eight down here, but, but seven, is probably going to put you fairly close to the top. All right, so take a couple minutes to finish getting all that labeled. So let's go on to the next step, and that is to plot the data as accurately as you can. Now, please don't plot anything yet, because let me show you what not to do. Right. <laughs> let's look at your very first data point that I gave you, which I believe was uh, 10 milliliters 10 milliliters, 12 grams. So you look at your graph, 10 milliliters, that's on the, on the x-axis. That's easy to find. You have a line that's already labeled 10. So you know it's somewhere along that line. 12 grams, that's going to be harder to find because you have a 10 line, you have a 20 line, but you don't have a 12. Now here's what not to do. And what some students will do is say, OK, well, 12, that's between 10 and 20. Uh, it's not quite halfway. Halfway is right about there, so 12 would be less than that, maybe right about there. And I'm not sure exactly where it is, so I'll just make that data point real big. Because if I make it big enough, by golly, part of that point's got to be a 12. Right? <laughs> that logic may make sense to you, but it's no good. We want to accurately plot this thing. Now, the problem is you have eight blocks representing 10 grams. So it's not like each one of those lines is a gram. In between the 10 and the 20, you either have 7 or 8. I'm going to draw it up here as if you have 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Or maybe you only have 7. Where in the world do you put 12? 
Let me take you through the, the mathematics of, of how you go about doing that. Here's the thing to do. Set up a ratio. We know that we have eight blocks for every 10 grams, or seven blocks for every 10 grams, whatever you have. And then we're going to set up a proportion. If there's eight blocks for every 10 grams, what I want to know is how many blocks are there, question mark, for how many grams? Well, let's think about it. We're trying to plot 12 grams. We already know where 10 is. How many grams past 10 is 12? Two, right? So my question is, how many additional blocks, that's the question mark, do I have to have for that extra two grams? I know where 10 is, I'm trying to get to 12. 12 is two grams past 10. There's eight blocks for every 10 grams, how many blocks are there for that additional two grams? That's what it comes down to. And that question mark, you can think of that as, as an X, that's your unknown. And then just do the algebra. And cross multiply, 16 is equal to 10x, x is equal to 1.6. All right, so now I know it's exactly 1.6 blocks. So now I go to my graph, here's 10 grams. This is the first block up, this is the second block up, and now I carefully estimate what 1.6 blocks looks like. And what I put at that point is a very, very tiny point. In fact, the smallest point that I can possibly make with my pencil is what I put there, because I want to show its precise location. Now, the only problem with making your data point teeny tiny like that is you might lose it. It's difficult to see when you look at the graph. So if you do this on the computer, what does Logger Pro automatically do any time it plots a point to keep you from losing it? And this is what you need to do when you plot it by hand, too. Yeah, it puts a circle around it. Right, or you, can, you can use a triangle, you can use any shape you want, but they're called point protectors because they protect the point, they protect the location of it. So for each data point you plot, tiny dot with a point protector around it. You can use circles or triangles or whatever you want. So now what I want you to do is take a few minutes for each of those six data points and plot them as accurately as you can on your graph paper. What we're going to do tomorrow is start looking how to construct graphs. I'm going to actually have you do a little graphing by hand. <laughs> it's like, why are we graphing by hand? And the clicker box is that? It's over there. Dave, you want to start that around so people can get those back in there. Uh, you guys think about why I would have you graph by hand. I mean, this is 2012. We have computers. Why would I ask you to graph by hand? You're just not a nice guy? Is that it addressed? He said, yeah, I'm just not a nice guy. No, a couple of reasons. Number one, you have a much better understanding of what the computer is doing when you can graph by hand. Number two, any of the AP science tests, they ask you to graph, and it is by hand. They have the axes already laid out for you, the grid work on the test. You have to graph on it. Right? Number three, college professors, many of them expect you to be able to graph by hand. Now, having said that, we're only going to do hand, hand graphing for the very first lab. Very first lab, I'm going to have you do it both ways. And assuming it looks like you know what you're doing after that lab, then all the subsequent labs for the rest of the year, I'll have you graph exclusively on the computer. All right? So make sure you, you get this the first time around, and we'll be good for the rest of the year. Right? Uh, keep working on your, your web assign. Don't forget that's due Wednesday night. Thursday's the, the quiz and significant figures.